everybody for coming. My name is Jean Delius. I'm on the faculty in the Environmental Studies Department at Huxley College of the Environment. Uh, I don't have any logistical items really for people in the class. Uh, we have a one credit seminar for some of the students here. Stephanie is pulling together everybody's papers to see what we have and what we don't have because papers come in at every different moment. And we have that all Excel spreadsheeted out. Um, we'll be here next week for another seminar, so no logistical items there. As for everybody, um, we are very happy to have with us Mike McDowell, and the title of his talk is 520 Bridge Expansion, Environmental Impacts and Assessments. Uh, Mr. McDowell is Principal Fisheries and Aquatic Scientist with Confluence Environmental Company. He has over 30 years of project experience managing and performing baseline biological and fishery studies, environmental impact statements, and monitoring programs for a wide variety of industries throughout the United States and around the world. He is a Huxley alumnus, and we're very pleased that he came. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Well, I should do this in a more organized fashion this time. Um, Mr. McDowell has agreed that he would like to come and have a beer if anybody wants to um, join us, I guess, at the Copper High after the talk. If you're going to do that, why don't you come down just so I know whether people are interested in to make sure that we're going. So at the end of the talk, if you want to have Western, buy you a beer. Um, come down and let me know. <laughs> <laughs> That's... That's new from our day. <laughs> That's the new kind of donor. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Well, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the 520 program. We've been working on it. Um, well, it's been underway. Uh, the replacement of the bridge has been underway for more than 15 years. Um, my company has been working on it for the last five um, and and that's when most of the action has happened. I'm going to be talking about um, uh, the strategies that were used during the environmental review process, um, how to meet the schedule when the governor says we're going to have the built, bridge built in, in 2014 and everybody who's on the project goes <laughs> How are we going to do that? Um, that seems like an impossible task. Um, and so there are strategies that were used in the environmental review process, NEPA and, and SEPA, um, to help make that happen. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, this, the real work um, that I think happens uh, in these projects, and that's in the environmental permitting. Um, Endangered Species Act compliance and um, taking care of all the rest of the of the laws and and regulations that exist at the federal, state, and local level, um, and that's what we've really been involved with. And then also uh, talk about what it takes for environmental mitigation for a project of this magnitude. It's a 4.6 billion dollar infrastructure project, um, the largest underway in the state of Washington. The 520 bridge is the longest floating bridge in the world. We don't often think that we have the biggest things around here, but um, in some cases we do, and, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about um, what, uh, what we've been doing. So the project goes from Interstate 5 across the lake and all the way out to Redmond. Um, there are really four major pieces um, to the project, um, and one of them doesn't happen in Lake Washington. It happens down in Aberdeen on the coast. Um, and that's where they're building the big pontoons. Um, and so I'll be talking about all of those. The bridge uh, project itself um, is broken into three separate pieces. Um, one of them is the east side, which is the blue line. Um, the floating bridge itself um, really is just this part. And then there's a west side piece that's actually the connection from the floating bridge to I-5. And that's the last one in line. That's what a schedule kind of looks like um, for one of these things with the, with the big things. They, the pontoons were important because they were a critical path items. If you, can't, if you don't have pontoons, you can't build a floating bridge. Um, and there was no facility that existed that was big enough to build the pontoons for this. So you had to get the pontoon facility permitted and built 
so that you could build the pontoons so that you could have them ready for the bridge. And so that became the critical path item. So in the EIS process, um, normally, especially under NEPA, uh, National Environmental Policy Act. I'm sorry, I'm going to I'm going to be speaking in al uh, alphabet soup of regulations today. I've got a whole list of them. One of the slides coming up. Um, you'll li you'll like it. Um, but this is you know this is kind of our world. In uh, under NEPA, normally this would all be one project. You'd have to consider the whole thing. But because the pontoons were so important, that had to go first. And so a rationale um, had to had to be. Uh, uh, derive for that, and I'll talk about that some more in a minute. So, let me just talk about the the projects. The east side is widening, it's restriping, redoing um, HOV lanes, uh, creating some uh, lids uh, over the uh, over the highway to reconnect um, some things. So that's an important part of that. The pontoon project again down in Aberdeen. Um, the site itself where they're building the pontoons is there. Our mitigation site is right over there. It's a 62-acre site that we'll I'll talk about a little bit more later also. Um, this is what a pontoon uh, facility looks like. Uh, this is it still under construction, the actual facility itself, but they're already building the forms for the pontoons even as they're building the facility to, to make them. Um, and this is before it was connected to the river. Um, so there's now a, a, a navigation channel here about 500 feet long uh, that connects to the river. Just to give you an idea of the scale, this is one of the big long longitudinal pontoons that's 360 feet long from one end to the other. Um, they're huge um, kinds, of, kinds of things. So in the environmental documentation, um, during the NEPA process, there had to be a rationale for this to be separate. Um, and the rationale was that this was a critical infrastructure because the 520 bridge is vulnerable to failure. It's kind of falling apart, it's old. Um, and so from a safety perspective, they had to have pontoons, whether the rest of the project happened or not, they had to have pontoons ready to replace the 520 bridge if it collapses. Um, and it's at risk of doing that, either under an earthquake or under some extreme wind conditions. Um, they have to close the bridge. So that was how the pontoon project got pulled out of the bigger project and dealt with separately and on a faster timeline. This is the existing bridge um, going across, uh, across the lake. Um, and this is, the, this is the east side. This is a fairly recent picture because there's one of the lids already under construction um, as part of, the, part of the east side project. Um, so these are the elements um, of that, uh, this, this main part of the project. Uh, so this is where the bridge is going to be replacing the existing bridge. It's going to be built in place next to the next to the existing bridge just to the north um, and once it's there and connected on both ends then the old bridge will be will be taken down again this is a separate project under under nepa um, separate utility here um, in dealing with um, with this uh, this part of the project this is our alphabet soup of regulations um, that that we deal with. So National Environmental Policy Act and the State Environmental Policy Act, we had to comply with both of those. Um, but the rest of it um, is when we get into the permitting um, and the Clean Water Act sections 404 and 401 um, regulate fill and wetlands um, and water quality issues. So those come from the Corps and from the Department of Ecology uh, Rivers and Harbor Act Section 10 has to do with navigation structures, um, and uh, so that's another core regulatory authority, another permit. Um, the HPA is a hydraulic project approval, comes from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. 
Um, again, all the pieces of the project require these things. Um, at the local level, you have critical areas ordinances that also cover wetlands and streams and all kinds of, uh, of other critical areas, um, and you need permits from the local authorities. We had nine um, permits from the city of Seattle, two from the city of Medina. Um, you know, it just, uh, it, it gets to be quite, quite a mess um, and a lot of work. Um, Coastal Zone Management Act also requires uh, approval. And you have uh, another big one is the Endangered Species Act. Of course, there are listed species in Lake Washington um, and, so, and in Grays Harbor. And so both, all, all pieces of the project uh, basically had the potential to uh, affect listed species. So we write, in addition to the EISs that we did over here, we write biological uh, uh, assessments under the Endangered Species Act. They're like an EIS, but they're very specialized and they cover specific uh, elements of the aquatic environment or the environments where the species um, live in their critical habitat. And those lead to, um, so we had three of those. We had, one for the, we had one for the east side project, one for the bridge, one for the pontoons. Um, so there were three of those and then we got five biological opinions. That's the BO is the biological opinion. That is prepared by the services. So either US Fish and Wildlife Service for the species that they regulate or the National Marine Fisheries Service or NOAA Fisheries for the species they regulate. And um, we only got five, not six. Um, usually both agencies prepare one of these biological opinions. Um, but in one case, we didn't have any species that were regulated by US Fish and Wildlife Service. And so they didn't, they didn't offer an opinion on that part of the project. And that was on the east side uh, project. Section 106 is, uh, has become much greater in importance these days. That's the archeological cultural resources um, compliance and uh, that sort of thing. Um, and US Coast Guard also gets um, in the act for all bridges. They regulate bridges and navigation. Uh, so, and then because this is a big state project, we have to make up our own um, acronym. So we have TWIGS, which are technical working groups, and we have PC PACs, which are pontoon construction uh, project uh, agency coordination team, um, and, and the ILFUP is the, is the newest one, and uh, that has to do with in lieu fee use program. So in lieu fee is a form of mitigation. Um, that, that we're using on the, on the project. So it's, that's, kind of, that's kind of been our world for the last five years, um, dealing with all that stuff. Manka. Just to clarify, has your firm been heading up all of those processes? So um, yeah, what we've been doing, um, members of my company have led the environmental permitting, the Endangered Species Act compliance, and mitigation planning and design. So those are the three big areas. So yes, most of those things that I just talked about, we've been leading um, the charge on all of those. We have just been managing big teams. Um, this is a you know, huge program. There have been hundreds of people working on it. Um, my folks have been managing teams of other scientists and consultants um, doing this. So I talked a little bit about the, um, again, the the environmental reviews being separated, the east side was separated from the rest of the project uh, because it had separate utility. Um, it was the restriping, the reorganization, the culverts um, that were redone, they had separate utility all by themselves aside from changing the bridge. So that made that project something that was separable from, from the rest. Um, one of the things that we also did, th this project is being done as a design build, um, which is a little bit different than the normal thing. A normal process is design bid build. So you have somebody that designs it, 
then the entity that's having it designed puts out a bid for somebody else to come in and construct it. In this case, they're hiring a design builder. So WashDOT took the design to a certain level, pretty conceptual in some cases, and then brought a design builder on board to work on finalizing the design and carrying it all the way through construction. This was an advantage um, and because we had the contractor on board. We were running the, the perm, uh, my little pointer just died. Um, we were running the uh, permitting and environmental review in parallel. So the EISs and the permitting processes were all going in, in parallel at the same time. They normally go in sequence. Normally you do the EIS first and then the permitting starts um, after that. So in this case, they were going side by side for the most part. And you had the design builder on board and you could actually work with them to avoid impacts. Um, they were able to inform the scientists about what was possible and what was not from a construction perspective. And they were engaged with the discussions with the regulatory agencies. And so the, the constraints coming from the regulators were able to be accommodated in the design and in the construction of the project. So it was a very efficient way to do things and kept things going. Another uh, important part of um, keeping this massive project going. And the other thing that happened is just an incredible amount of agency coordination, meeting after meeting after meeting, um, and getting the agencies, the regulators, also engaged um, on a regular basis with the project and working through these problems um, as they came up. The tricky part of a design build is that you permit the thing and you don't know exactly what's going to happen. And the contractor is constantly looking for new ways and better thing, better ways to do things. And so there's constant change. And so part of what we're working on now is going back to the agencies and getting approval for the changes that are coming down the line. Um, so I talked about the independent utility. Um, we had to go, come up with a preferred alternative um, in order to engage with the agencies uh, as part of the impact assessment. Um, and again, the design build approach um, allowed all of these things to be going in parallel so that uh, the project could keep moving forward. The uh, design freeze was something that was a, a, big, a big term for us because we had to get to at least a design that everybody could agree on um, for the permitters and uh, the regulators to say, okay, yeah, you can build that. And this is what we're gonna do. And um, Endangered Species Act uh, was a, a huge driver in this and continues to be um, in the way we uh, are building the project now. There's uh, uh, and kind of a continuous uh, cycle of reinitiations with various things that come up. One of the things that we're doing right now with the pontoon facility down in Aberdeen is when they build it, build the pontoons, then they flood the facility. The pontoons float and they float them out. Well, when they flood the facility, you can get fish going in. When you put the gate back, the fish have nowhere to go. And so part of our process is how do we get the fish out of there um, and how do we handle them and what happens if we get listed species. Um, and so this is all part of, um, part of the process. As I said, having the um, design builders on board allowed for um, alterations in the designs um, and informing uh, the avoidance and minimization measures in particular um, that are important uh, for permitting and for ESA compliance. So there were lots of these meetings. Um, and one of the things that it really led to was everybody um, understanding all the elements of the project, 
and having a high degree of confidence in what was going to be built um, in the end and how it was going to be done. Um, and that, for the most part, has, has worked out. And it was particularly important to get uh, the, the Indian tribes on board with this. They're, they're often not uh, engaged in the permitting process and kind of come in at the end, which can cause trouble if they haven't been. But we were able to really successfully engage with the tribes and, um, and keep the process moving forward. These are all the folks that we were working with. Um, I'm not going to list them, but I, it's, a, it's a pretty impressive list. Um, the University of Washington is a, is a big player, obviously, uh, with a big part of the bridge. So how do you mitigate for something like this? There are, mitigation, there are impacts to wetlands. There are impacts to the aquatic environment. Um, and so we have uh, a mitigation program that encompasses 185 acres of new or restored habitat in total. Um, the biggest single piece is the uh, uh, 64 acre uh, estuary restoration that uh, happened uh, as compensation for impacts from the pontoon facility down in Grace Harbor. Um, and that was a situation where we took out levees and reintroduced intertidal exchange uh, with an inter uh, intertidal marsh system over this 62 acre site. It's uh, really a pretty exciting uh, project on Grass Creek. Um, it was a big 31-acre uh, floodplain um, restoration, uh, a whole raft of uh, kind of aquatic site restoration along the shorelines of Lake Washington um, that are uh, um, pretty fun. And we're doing a big, uh, some big things right around the bridge. Uh, this is. Um, what's uh, referred to as the Washdot Peninsula. It's right at the Arboretum um, in Seattle. Uh, and there's going to be a big restoration there. A lot of the old structure uh, of, ex of the existing bridge is going to go away. And um, this area is going to be opened up and restored. Um, so it'll be uh, quite nice and exciting. Um, Another one at uh, Magnuson Park, which is a little north of, uh, of the lake. This is an old uh, naval air station um, back in World War II era. Um, there's going to be a connection to the, to the lake um, out, out there, and then a, a huge uh, restoration of the wetland complex um, into, the, into the parklands there. Um, so that's, a, that's another big one. Um, this is a levee setback project on the Cedar River. One of the things that was really valuable to do with this is uh, Cedar River has listed species. They have a restoration plan, but they didn't have much money to implement the restoration plan. So you come along with a big project like this with a lot of money, um, almost $200 million um, total in mitigation um, for the project. And we're able to fund the high uh, priority restoration projects um, in in some of these areas, and this is an example of one of them. We're going to be able to create a back channel. Um, as I said, it's a levee setback, so open up the floodplain um, and let the river uh, act more naturally um, in this area. And there are several others. I, these are just a few examples that I wanted to share. So this is what um, I talked about this, uh, thanks to Manka's question earlier. But here, this is what we've been doing. Um, at, uh, we're a small company. There are, are only 12 of us. Um, back when we started this, there were really only six of us. And four of them were working full time um, on, on this project uh, for about three years. Um, now. Things are being built. Um, the project has been permitted. We have ongoing stuff that I talked about, um, but uh, it's uh, actually um, underway now. Um, that's the old bridge. And that's an idea of what the new one is going to look like. It's much bigger. It's going from two, uh, two lanes in each direction to three. Um, so uh, and. Uh, um, 
there will be a dedicated uh, HOV lane each each way, bike paths, um, and it's a, just a much bigger a much bigger structure. Um, and it's kind of being built. It's a little bit hard to see, um, but oop. Um, the big long pontoons are the ones underneath in the middle. The big long, the 360 foot long um, ones, and then these are smaller pontoons that are connected kind of like outriggers on a on a canoe um, on on either side and then the bridge deck itself is built um, up above those uh, which will also change the name of the bridge it's uh, often referred to these days as the brushless car wash because in the winter when you get storms um, the waves go over the top of the bridge but it'll be high enough now that that won't happen anymore so anyway that's the 520 bridge program and what we've been doing and um, I wanted to be leaving time for questions so yes sir Around Lake Washington, uh, Chinook salmon, uh, steelhead um, are both listed species in the Lake Washington uh, Cedar River uh, basin. And um, you know we dealt with a lot of other species, um, orca, um, because the pontoons get um, pulled through Puget Sound on their way from, well, up the coast uh, from Grace Harbor and through Puget Sound. Um, so, yeah, we dealt with a lot of things that aren't just in the, in the lake. Yes? So what are some examples of mitigation that you've done? Because um, you talked about all the EIS and stuff like that to reduce the impact. Mm-hmm. Right. So, this is a mitigation site. Um, and so what we're doing here is uh, right now there's a levee that keeps the river going in this narrow, narrow little corridor. And we're gonna take that out, um, allow the river to re-engage with the floodplain. Part of what we're gonna do is gonna build a back channel. Um, that's that kind of purplish spur going back um, up there. And then with uh, a wetland area, both well we've got river mig we got channel migration zone which is kind of the blue hatch and then the yellow hatch in the back there is is wetland and riparian zone and um, so this is a habitat restoration um, as part of the mitigation uh, the back channel habitat is important for juvenile um, fish uh, the juvenile salmon like to be able to get out of the main stem in the winter when the flows are high they're looking for quiet backwater um, areas and so uh, that used to be abundant on rivers like the Cedar and uh, kind of natural rivers um, around here and it's less abundant now these days since we've we like the rivers to stay where they are because we build houses or bridges across them or uh, whatever and so we put a lot of levees on on rivers um, or have in the past um, we're now taking a lot of those levees out, um, and this is an example of, of one of those. So that's, that's one. Um, again, this is, um, since I used to live near Magnuson Park, um, used to walk my dog down here a lot, um, and you know, the, the areas out there are pretty wet right now. They, they are wetlands, but they're disconnected from the lake. Um, and so, again, uh, by providing uh, a connection between the lake and these wetlands, you provide a, an opportunity for juvenile fish to get in there and use the protected and uh, productive habitat of the wetlands uh, for rearing, um, and it increases the productivity of, of the system. So again, this is uh, an example of, of mitigation. The Grass Creek project that I talked about down in in uh, Grace Harbor is another example, um, kind of reconnecting the estuary to 60 acres of marsh habitat that it had been isolated from by um, 
uh, levies in the past. That explain it? So it's all of these combined, um, and there are a bunch of them. Yes, sir. The Sammamish Slough, yeah, no, yeah, no direct effects um, up there. Um, the contractor is using some land up in Kirkland for some of the staging, um, which is close to the mouth of the slough, but there are no direct effects to the slough at all. Yes, sir. Um, when you're doing the river mitigation, taking out the levees, how mm -hmm. far Yeah, um, it, that's something that we look at pretty thoroughly. Obviously, people are worried about uh, that sort of thing. Um, and so that is part of the design. And um, I can't tell you right off the top of my head how far downstream uh, they look, but it's quite a ways because um, you, you don't want this to unravel things um, where you don't want them unraveled, for sure. Yes? Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, um, it's really complex uh, because the coming up with with ratios um, because of the different kinds of impacts, um, and so it was a little different um, everywhere uh, and. So I can't give you a, a single a single number. Um, just there were a, um, it was um, in Aberdeen. Uh, it was about six to one, so uh, a little bit more than that, um, seven to one. We, we had about nine acres of wetland impacts on the site where the um, where the pontoon facility was built. We our mitigation site is 62 acres. So um, you know that's that's an example. Um, the uh, for the aquatic stuff, you know, the stuff over the water, because that's another another aspect of this. Um, it's really complex because this bridge, the new bridge, is bigger than the old bridge. But part of the mitigation is taking the old bridge out. Um, and so there's a whole combination of, you know, yeah, you're, you're replacing structure here, but you're removing structure here, and then a whole uh, slew of, of uh, projects along the shoreline to increase um, the value of aquatic habitats in the lake. So it's pretty com complicated, so I can't give you a, a, an easy number. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, we definitely met that, and then some. Um, the there are two. Uh, well, I mean, there are two main watersheds: um, the Chehalis Grays Harbor watershed, uh, where the pontoon facility is, and then Lake Washington. Um, and so, the Lake Washington Cedar River watershed um, is uh, uh, Wire Eight um, in the state, and um, so that's where a lot of a lot of the impacts are from the actual bridge construction, um, and. So one of the main places that we went was the um, uh, salmon recovery plan that was developed for Wire 8. Uh, and what were the priority habitat restoration projects that had been identified there that would be of the highest value to uh, the listed species? Um, and so that was one of the first places we looked. We also um, obviously were engaged with the municipalities around, around the lake. Um, and so we talked to them about what were their high priority um, issues because most of them have done uh, uh, surveys and uh, compiled inventory about what they would like to do if they had the money to do it. Um, and so we were, we really, and then obviously a lot of coordination with the Indian tribes and the, and the state and federal agency folks. Um, and they were also sources of information. So there were, 
kind of multiple um, sources that led to the selection of the of the projects that were ultimately uh, picked. Um, there were lots that weren't um, that weren't picked. Um, so uh, you know, but these were the high priority ones that kind of came to the top of the list for everybody. Yes. Yeah, that's um, under state law, um, under SEPA, the State Environmental Policy Act, um, that is now required to look at um, what your carbon um, impacts are um, uh, for, for global warming concerns. Um, I'm a fish biologist, so um, that's not my <laughs> that's not my area <laughs> of expertise. Uh, I trust that the air guys um, dealt with that, but I, that's not something I was involved with. But it was af absolutely something that was uh, evaluated in the environmental <laughs> review process. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, there are 115,000 vehicles that use this bridge every day, um, and one of the um, one of the ways that the new bridge may be better than the old one is uh, it increases dramatically the capacity for high occupancy vehicles um, because it's going to have dedicated HOV lanes. And so one of the hopes is that people will use more mass transit instead of getting in their car um, if the buses are moving more efficiently across the bridge. And so the question is, what would you say was the greatest, is, and I know you've done lots of complex projects, this is just one, mm -hmm. what have been sort of the greatest overarching challenges to being successful in a multifaceted, multi-stakeholder complex project, and what skills do you think you and your firm personally bring to that that you'd like to encourage students to be? about as they're, you know, going through their education? Well, uh, you know, um, one of the things that I didn't learn until well after school, um, didn't learn at, un at the undergraduate level, didn't learn in graduate school, um, for sure, um, was the, the interplay of, of the regulations. Um, you know, we had an EIS class. I assume that Huxley still has an EIS class. Everybody take the EIS class? Yeah? Is that a requirement for everybody to take the EIS class? Or anyway, anyway um, I remember taking the EIS class. But um, so we learned about, about NEPA. And that was back in, yes, yeah, uh, something. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was back in, in uh, 77, probably, um, is when I took that. So. NEPA was all of eight years old um, at, at that time. We hardly, hardly knew how to, how to work it um, at that point. Um, so um, the, uh, but nobody ever talked about what comes after the environmental review. Nobody ever talked about what comes after NEPA or SEPA. And uh, I talked about the permitting um, and, and that's where a lot of our work um, really happens. Um, and so it's uh, meeting the requirements of the Corps of Engineers and the Department of Ecology, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, NOAA Fisheries, meeting the, the, all of those requirements um, at the same time coming up with a project that can actually be built um, is, is something that is a, is a real challenge. So how do you get successful in all of that? Um, we brought a team um, to this. One of the guys who, the guy, the guy who was in charge of, uh, Scott White, um, one of my partners, uh, was in charge of the environmental permitting. Um, and he's a planner. Also a Western grad, 
not a Huxley grad, um, so we, we try not to hold that against him, but he's a Western grad, um, came out of the business and economics department of all things, but he's an environmental planner. He understands, you know, that the whole list of regulations. Um, he understands those regulations and how they all interact in a way that, uh, and at a, a depth of understanding that is, is beyond me. And he comes with an incredible ability to keep things organized. Um, in the in the face of chaos um, and incredible pressures, um, and so he worked miracles in making all of that happen and coordinating with all the agencies and bringing all that together at the same time. And then we had good scientists who were working on the mitigation design um, and. Um, coming up with uh, a program that all the agencies could get behind and approve um, as appropriate mitigation for the for the project of, of this scale um, and then making the Endangered Species Act um, compliance really work um, because the National Marine Fishery Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife, when they write a biological opinion, they put in conditions that are absolute conditions and you have to meet them. Um, that uh, as part of the project, uh, they have real teeth and um, and uh, some real power to make make things happen. And so, um, bringing all of those things together, so it's a coordination process um, as as much as anything else. Um, and so, a diverse skill set, a really effective team um, working together is what makes it makes it possible. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about whether he did scoping on this, what it involved, whether he got 106,000 comments on it. Not that many. <laughs> um, uh, and um, yeah, I think that. I don't know how many total comments there are on Gateway, but it's more than 106,000, I think. But it's a it's a huge number. Um, yeah, there was a, a, a massive scoping process that happened with this. Like I said, the project has been going for more than 15 years. Um, a lot of that happened early on, but it was also happening um, four and five years ago when the when the EISs were being put together. We were not directly involved in the EIS um, process, um, and so I can't really speak to the um, number of comments, but I'm sure there were many thousands. Um, it is a controversial project. It's um, still facing challenges um, on the west side in Seattle. Um, uh, lots of people have a lot of concern about how the bridge is going to look um, in front of their multi-million dollar house. Um, and so, yeah, there's, um, that's still a challenge. There's a challenge on the east side as well. Um, the Medina and, uh, folks were not real thrilled. Um, but, yes, sir. I'm not sure if you would speak on this, but with your project. But I can try. Yeah. By <laughs> incorporating HOV lanes. Yeah. Uh, just because opening up the HOV lane for public transportation and for carpooling gives other uh, people in the center to, to drive because it lowers the amount of time uh, that take on the bridge. Right. Do you have any uh, idea about the impact of I am not a traffic engineer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't. <laughs> that one that one I don't think I can I can handle. Yeah. I can see the logic behind it though. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, how is the water, you know, the marine traffic navigation? I know some of the Mercer Island bridges, they have a section that opens up. It's, it's the... Uh, There's going to be no, no opening section in this bridge. There, uh, in the existing bridge, um, there, yeah. it does open in the middle. 
or it in theory can open in the middle. Um, and there actually are opening it right now on a fairly regular basis um, to let boats through because with the construction, the east side high rise of the bridge is completely blocked right now by all the construction activity of the new bridge in that location because it's actively being built right now. Um, the new bridge will not have this in, um, but it will have higher, um, it'll have, it'll have actually more clearance than the existing bridge does when it's, when it's done. Yep, yeah. Yeah, that's part of the Coast Guard uh, permitting process is figuring out all of that, all that navigation stuff. Um, so the new bridge will be better once it's finished um, than the existing bridge. Um, and it, so it avoids this, yep. Um, I don't know for certain. Um, my guess is that it will be recycled. Um, uh, concrete is a pretty valuable resource these days and, um, and most of it is, uh, I'm sure, will be ground up and turned into a new road in somewhere. There's also a lot of steel in these, in these things. Um, I should have put in a picture that I took of uh, the inside of one of the forms um, down in the pontoon um, basin. The, the rebar is, you know, is like this, and it's and it's incredibly thick in there. There's a huge amount of steel, and just the steel value out of out of the old bridge will more than pay for the cost of of uh, grinding it up and separating it out. Uh, there's a lot of value there, um, and that it will get used and recycled. Yes, sir. Well, um, I think it's an excellent project um, environmentally. I think a lot of high value um, restoration and, and mitigation is getting done as a result of this. Um, it is necessary infrastructure. You know, if we want to want to have people and want to have a big city and a big municipal area like Seattle and Bellevue, Redmond, um, we kind of need this sort of infrastructure. The existing bridge, unfortunately, is pretty frail um, and is in danger of failure, um, and so needs to be replaced. It's kind of unfortunate it's being replaced sooner than anybody thought it would really need to be, but it's just the reality of the situation. So um, I guess I'm kind of a, a practically minded guy when it comes to that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, the bridge is necessary. 115,000 vehicles a day is a lot of traffic to try and redistribute somewhere else, some other way. Um, it's really not practical to do. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know. I, um, it, the existing bridge is the longest. Um, the new one's going to be a little bit longer, um, uh, just because of, the, of its alignment. Um, uh, so um, I don't know of any place else that's building big floating bridges um, like this. So it may stay that way. Yeah, <laughs> maybe so. Yeah, who knows. <laughs> No, uh, it's 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 smaller. I had an idea. I had the impression that the Hoods Canal Bridge was the biggest or the longest. No, it's not. Yeah, yeah, it's not. This this, uh, this, this is this is longer. Yep, yep. Yes, ma'am. Was there any mitigation for species that weren't covered under the Endangered Species Act? You know, like issues about biodiversity concern or or maybe local species that needed special protection? Well, um, you know, with uh, a lot of the species in the, in the lake that are of, con of interest to folks, uh, particularly the Salmonids, not all of them are listed, but they all benefit in similar ways to the habitat that is being 
uh, created. In fact, um, you know, a lot of the shoreline stuff will benefit not just Chinook, um, but also sockeye salmon um, that are uh, a, a big part of the Lake Washington system. Um, certainly the wetlands are of value to a whole variety of species, uh, birds, amphibians, and, um, and mammals um, as well. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the mitigation sites will um, provide uh, ecological resources that a, a number of species will use. So um, the listed species get a lot of attention, um, for sure. Um, and they drive a lot of the restoration um, priorities um, at all levels of, of government as a result. Um, but there are other species that derive a lot of benefit too. Thank you very much, Mike. Let's thank Mike for